Welcome to the Lights Out Podcast. This is Chris Lights Out Lytle, and this is our journey to document the history of mixed martial arts. I have brought with me my friend, the MMA detective Mike Davis, and together we will preserve the history and hear some great stories from the world in the era of the no-holds bar. Thank you and enjoy. Welcome back to the Lights Out MMA History Podcast. I am Joey Venti. With me, as always, the MMA detective, Mike Davis. Today, we have a very special episode. Our guest today is a pioneer and a legend, Carlson Gracie Black Belt, four-time national Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu champion, 1999 Mundial champion, and the only UFC champion to successfully submit the number one contender two times in the same night, Marilio Bustamante. It's an honor. Thank you for being with us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for thank you for the invitation. It's my pleasure to be here. So, Marilo, you. you've got a historic career, incredibly underappreciated, at least here in the United States. And um, it's truly an honor to have you here. There's a couple things we'd like to address. The first one on your Wikipedia page, it says that you started with Luta Livre. Is that true? No, no. That's that's what I thought. Somebody made a a joke. Probably I have to to care of that. Okay. And your beginnings. How would you describe your entry into the world of jujitsu? Yes. Uh, you. Know, uh, um, my I have older brothers, right? Uh, my older brother is, is is nine years older than me. So they already trained jiu-jitsu when I was a kid. I was around 10 years old. And they took me to, to the gym with them, you know, to, to know, to, know uh, to see the training, get in contact with jiu-jitsu. And then at the beginning, I went there to, to just to hang out. And, you know, I was a kid. It was bothering more people, bother more than anything else. And I used to go there and then like it. And then I start training. I got into when I was around 11 years old. But before that, I, I, I played judo on my school, like I was a seven to eight years old, something like that. I was a little kid. So six to eight, I don't remember a long time. There was a coach teaching judo on my school. I think it's elementary, right? Elementary yes. school, yeah. So and then I practice for maybe six months, and then later I start jujitsu when I was ten to eleven, something like that, you know. Uh, because of my older brothers, that's why I got in contact with jujitsu. Jujitsu at the time was very it was sport. It was a sport, just with uh, you know a few people practicing in Rio. It wasn't it was a no, a no, you know, no not to know, not too much people know jiu-jitsu at the time. And I just get into because my older brothers, you know, that's the only reason. <clears throat> okay. Well, you're, you you talked about training judo. Was that with George Medi? No, Medi, George Medi, I trained when I was already a brown belt. Uh, I had a couple, not a couple, I have some coaches in judo. Medi was my third coach in judo. So I know there was a bit of a rivalry between the Gracie family and George Medi and his teachings. Was there conflict with you being working out there? No, no. At the time, you know, it, I heard that conflict. It was a old, old school. Like, it wasn't from my time, you know, before I born and I, I, when I was there, I didn't know anything, so I just knew that after. But no, my my old my you know my former coach Carson, he didn't complain, you know. So I mean, he got a little bit jealous, but he, he never complained. So everything I did to, yeah, it's fun, you know. But it's true, but uh, he never kind of complained uh, hardly. I mean, you know, he never he never. For me, for for Biden me to go there, but he kind of he thought it was unnecessary. So, in terms of judo practitioners, George Medi, Alex Davis, those are some of the better known practitioners in the country of Brazil. Um, how how was George Medi's teaching? 
Now, George Medi is a different level. I mean, he's probably he was the one that with the best skill in judo in, in Brazil, and one of the best. You know, he was a top top of the top. It was a different level. You know, he was he 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 lived in Japan. So for a long time, he trained judo with the Japanese for a long time. His skills was amazing, you know. So just a few, like, Brazilians had, I believe, had the same, like... Uh, Pedigree. No, you know, knowledge. Knowledge, knowledge right. and, and of him, like, you know, some maybe some uh, Japanese people from the colony, Japanese colony in Sao Paulo. Uh, you know, but he was kind of top of top level. I, I, but I trained with him just for one, one month, not that much, one too much. Okay, not okay. That much. But I learned a lot. You know, I always, and from there I got a good relationship with him. At a very young age, you also met very famous boxing trainer Claudio uh, Claudio Coelho. Coelho, yes, yes. Would you describe your experiences with him? Yeah. Uh, so Claudio was made up, uh, his, his, his coach, the name Edson, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot his, his surname. He, they teach boxing and a lot of people from the school, I trained Jiu Jitsu Kassan school, they were training boxing there. And then when I was around 18 to 19 years old, uh, I started training there, not often, but sometimes, you know, especially when I got some hurt on my knees and I couldn't train jiu-jitsu and then I, I go to boxing because I just need to use my hands and my arms, and, you know, so I could save my, my, my knee, recover my knee, doing something that I like to do, like martial arts. So that's, and then I start training boxing not that hard, but more, more for fun, you know, it wasn't like sparring, everything very light. I only start training hard boxing, like really true boxing, when I was to fight uh, the, 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 the challenge between Jiu Jitsu and Luta Livre. Then I really trained boxing super hard. Um. Would you tell us how you met Carlson Gracie and when your relationship became strong? I'm sorry, say it again. Would you tell us how you met Carlson Gracie? Like the time you met Carlson Gracie and when you knew that you were accepted by him on the team? No, I, 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 I get in the academy was when I was a kid. So I grew up inside the academy. So then... Uh, Getting, getting older, you know, like a teenager, I was a surfer and I had a, a very, I, a, I was a healthy kid. Like uh, I was a good spy for everyone because I had, I had a lot of energy and I, 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 I didn't mind to tap. So I used to train with guys much better than me and I was a good spy for them. And, you know, on the other hand, they teach me something. I was teaching something. I was demand. I was asking them to teach me something. So, and then I start to learn jiu-jitsu and then when I start competing, I kind of show my potential. First competition, I got a gold and, you know, I, I, I compete very well, so beat my two fights. I was a juvenile at the time, 16, I think 16, 15 to 16 or 16 to 17, it was a long, long time ago. And then I started to compete. And then I, I, I found myself, you know, I kind of uh, really liked the competitions and, you know, the adrenaline make me feel good for some reason. And I started to compete very well, win the bad, you know, the most of the competitions. And then I got in the team. So simple like that. Okay. So we do a question and answer on the underground forum and Hitman Dan posted a question what point did you realize that you had to choose between professional surfing and, and fighting? Because your surfing background is a, a very respectable level as well. Yeah, but, you know, I am a, I am a teenager, you know. I, I was amateur. I could, I could surf. Uh, 
But actually, in the competitions, I, 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 I lose. I wasn't a good competitor in surf. You know, surf, you depend on waves and natural, you know, things. And so I, I got a little bit anxious waiting my wave. And you know, I made a lot of mistakes during the, the hits. And I wasn't a good competitor in surf. That's the truth. And then when I started competing in jiu-jitsu, I realized it was most of about me, about myself, you know, so about my performance, about my performance, being good or not. So okay. then I started to have good results. And then I, you know, I kind of, uh, I, I found myself, you know, it was the kind of things that I was a teenager, very insecure kid and very shy. And then I started to do something that I was good and make me feel better, make me feel stronger self-confident you know so and then I, I i like it so much i couldn't stop my whole life i compete till 45 years old <laughs> right, right well the beginning of your competition career at least in terms of no holds barred fighting it started september 26 1991 desafio it was luta livre versus jiu-jitsu and it was nationally august televised. 31st August 31st, 1991. Some people, they, 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 they assume it's a different date, but it, 100% is August 31st. Okay, so we're going to correct 31. that. That's from the Fight Finder. I make a shitload of mistakes. This is not one of them. Sorry. No problem. No problem. No problem. <laughs> Just because, you know, the funny thing, uh, they made a, a T-shirt with the uh, wrong date. And I... And I tried to correct, and they said, no, 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 it's September, September. No, no, it's August 31st, you know, and I, I am 100% sure of that. Anyway, it's very common. It was a long time ago, and it's hard to, to, to keep the, the date correct. So this was a kind of a controversial event because it pitted two teams that had a, a very, very bad rivalry between each other, and it was broadcasted nationally. Your opponent was Marcel Mendez. Yes, and, yes. What do you recall about that event? Uh, man, it's, uh, it was a, a, a challenge. Uh, I think it was the second challenge that Luta Livre and Jiu-Jitsu got involved with. The first one, I think, was 80, 1983 or 84. And I watched it. Uh, I was a very young kid, like uh, I think I was a 17 to 18 years old. And it was something different, you know, like, so it's a challenge well, that the Jiu Jitsu got involved, got involved. And I, and I was already black belt in 1991. There was a, another challenge and I was uh, on the, the, the best, you know, competitors in black belt. I was always on podium. I was first or second, most of the time, first gold medalist in most of the tournaments. So it was about my generation. So, you know, being one of the guys that was on top, I I, found, I, I, I think I found, I mean, I'm sure. Uh, I, you know, I, I believe it was my obligation to 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 to, to to represent Jiu-Jitsu, or at least uh, put my name on list to represent Jiu-Jitsu. And, you know, that the, uh, the least I could do to help the sport that I love so much, that gave me so much benefits, you know, so help me so much and give me something. I mean, give me a lot of things. Uh, help me to, 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 to become to become a you know a stronger person, more confident, you know, so much benefits, and I I I believe it was my time to to, to pay back. And okay. then I you know I, it wasn't about fame or money that didn't have money involved, at all. you know. So they have expectation to have a, to be broadcast. So at least was broadcast in the biggest TV in Brazil. So, but. At the beginning, we expected, we didn't expect that. So, it scared a lot of the the people in your country. Though, was there a lot of pushback after it was aired? 
Yeah, it was something uh, aggressive. They said it on, to TV, to the, 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 you know, to, the, to the company, TV company, that would have allowed to have punches and, you know, like they said, was like just a lapse. <laughs> but we know, we knew that it would be a hard fight. Like everything would be allowed to do it. So uh, I think it didn't, it, it haven't been broadcast for a long, long time in Brazil. I think the last time they broadcast a Vale Tudo, it was the 60s or 70s in Brazil, something like that. And my generation never watched it, you know, something on TV like that. So it was a kind of shock, but for another side, in different view, a lot of a lot of people start training jiu-jitsu because they, 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 they realize how good was the the, 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 the the sport. And then a lot of you know a lot of people start training like after the, the challenge, the academies, the jiu-jitsu academy was back of full of back full of people, you know, they got a you know completely full. Okay. And that's it. It was somewhat uh, controversial with uh, your opponent, Mendez, falling out of the ring and, and hitting his head. Um, future UFC 1 referee, Joao Bajeto, um, was, the, yes. was the person. That was uh, yes. Uh, for accident, uh, Marcelo Mendes was a brother of one of the members of Carson. Was his, his brother was a student in Carson Academy, was a super nice guy. So it was something not uncomfortable because his brother was so nice, so nice. He, he understood the both sides. But Marcelo, he was a good fighter, but I believe he wasn't prepared for what happened, you know. So I used to compete a lot in Jiu Jitsu, and, and, and the competitions in Jiu Jitsu has a lot of rivalry. You know, the academy kind of people screaming and, you know, close to the, to the, to the maps and a different, uh, at the time, people just sit around the mat. Nowadays, you have to keep the distance, you know, so they're going close, too close to the mat. But at the time, people sit around the mat, they used to sit around the mat, they scream and, you know, it was a, it's a different environment that for some reason prepare the, the, the jiu-jitsu team to this kind of challenge, help us. And, you know, uh, for us, for me, uh, uh, talking about myself was something that uh, I thought would be very nervous at the day, because it was my first fight, real fight, as a professional. And I was completely calm. You know, when I stepped in the ring, it was so calm, like no feelings at all. No, no nerves, no, no, no fear, no, no angry, no nothing. You no, know? so just were there, and um, everything happens pretty easy. I mean, uh, uh, my performance was was perfect because I was training for so long, and when I start fighting, I did everything I was training, so I was very well prepared. That's excellent. So, how would you describe the Luta Livre life rivalry with the Gracie Jiu Jitsu? <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's a rivalry that uh, starts with uh, for a silly thing like uh, a fight on the street between members, a member of uh, Gracie family and a Luta Livre member. And it's a long time ago, before, I, before when I was a, a blue belt at the time. And then there was some... Uh, 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 Fights and, and, and on the street, so the the, the the rivalry was it was only it wasn't only sportive. It, it happened some meetings on the street and people fight and you know yeah crazy. And then uh, before my my ninety one, Hickson have he fought uh, one of the guys from Duarte. Um, Hugo Duarte, and then you know, before he, he moved to U.S., so so it was a big rivalry, you know. And well, before Hickson and Hugo Duarte, 
did Helio also fight a Luta Libre guy on the street? Helio Gracie, I mean? Yeah, Helio. I don't know. I don't know. It's a different time. He fought a lot of people. Helio fought a lot of people, you know, on the ring. I don't know if he fought on the street, but, you know. But it's a different Luta Livre, I think. Uh, Luta Livre were, were too small at the time. Then I think it helps Luta Livre to get famous, this rivalry against Jiu Jitsu. Uh, the grill during this time. Uh, but Jiu Jitsu beat them three fights of the night, you know. And but Jiu Jitsu got much stronger after this challenge, you know, could prove how good Jiu-Jitsu were. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and after that, taking time, you know, uh, some guys from Luta Livre went to train my team, you know, so the peace, uh, we made the peace for some reason after the, this challenge. The feelings, you know, uh, calmed down and I mean, I think we realized that, you know, there were different, uh, I mean, uh, there were big events in the world and this kind of rivalry was, would, would, would bother the, 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 the grow of the, the, the fighters. I mean, the, 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 the development of the fighters, the, the, the improvement of the sport. So I think the last, big fight between Jiu-Jitsu and Luta Livre was during the Pentagon combat. That was uh, Enzo. a show. Uh, I fought uh, Joe, uh, Jerry Bolander. That was uh, the one of the champs in UFC. He was one of the best guys, middleweight in UFC. And I fought him. And then the schedule of fight between Enzo and Eugenio Tadeo. But I think the mistake at the time was that they didn't they didn't invest in the security, so the security was too too small. So then the problem comes from there. Okay, so to kind of set that table, that was September twenty seventh, nineteen ninety seven. We're skipping ahead a little bit. The yeah. lights got turned out at the event yes. in yeah. a full riot. <laughs> In our interview with Bob Ballou, he said he had a knee injury. He was sitting up at the top, and he enjoyed watching it. Everybody else <laughs> seems to say they were kind of afraid. Um, Jerry Bolander, your opponent, was from that lion's den. He was 7-1, and one, and this event included headbutts and uh, yes. his bare knuckle. No gloves, no gloves, and kicks, and, you know. So bare knuckles, so it was uh, really valid to the fight. <laughs> and Bolander, current police officer out in California, you upkicked Bolander, and it was somebody yes. from your corner that said it. It was either Babel or Carlson. Who who called that kick? No, the truth is that the kick was already being trained for a long time. You know, so I used to train after the. There was a boxing, big, you know, a boxing bag. And I sit in front of the box bag after my training and I step and I train the, the, the aim. Like, you know, I train my, my, with my heels, reach the, 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 the target, bang, bang, many times, you know, then another leg. I, I train with both legs. So that make me, my kick very precise. I mean, it was something, you know, because the kick don't need to be too strong, it must be too precise. So then I, I kind of, when I, when, I, when I reached the position, I, I didn't think that much, you know. People screamed from outside, but I didn't hear, so I was already connected to the position. It's the same kick <laughs> that Henzo knocked out Oleg Tektarov with, the same yes. style. Yes, same style. Because it's, it, it, it is a very important uh, 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 weapon from, 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 if you fight from, from the ground, you can kick your opponent, you know, make you, you safer. So then you must develop this game. It's brilliant. Uh, Does not have any reason to you don't, 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 don't sharp your, your, your kicks from the bottom and know how to kick, you know, the, West, the best way to kick. 
You beat Joe Charles June 24th, 1996 by arm triangle, but your toughest, most grittiest performance is on. It's, it's coming up next. You fought in an eight man tournament in Alabama. And is this your first trip outside of Brazil? Uh, yeah, my first trip when I was 12 years old, I went to Disneyland, you know, in, in Florida. But after that, I didn't travel outside. So then it was my first trip and I was an adult. An adult. So yeah. that's November 22nd, 1996. It's in Alabama. Man, if you look at the people in that tournament, like here you got Chris Hazeman. He's a pioneer from Australia. Um, you win in one, one minute with a knockout. You get Juan Mott, you knock him out, and then in the finals, you get an every bit of 300 pounds Tom Erickson. That was the two fights. The second fight was uh, Juan Mott, I think so. I yes. got two fights, and the third fight was the, 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 the Tom Erickson. You guys fought for 40 minutes. Yeah, supposed to be 30. <laughs> <laughs> And so, after 10, after 10, they said no more time. So they just put more 10 minutes. After the 30 minutes, they said, okay, more 10 minutes. But we fought with no limit after 10, 10 minutes fighting. They said no more time, no more limits, time limit to just fight. <laughs> so Tom Erickson is in your corner. And he's fending off your submission one after another after another. It's one of the most grueling fights that you could you could possibly watch. It's very, very difficult. In your corner, you had Carlson Gracie and Mario Sperry. In Tom Erickson's corner, he had Mark Coleman and Rico Chiaparelli. Was Chiaparelli warned not to corner or help Tom Erickson for your fight? Say it again. Uh, so Rico was a Henzo student. He was yes. a purple belt under Henzo. Did Henzo yes. tell him not to train Erickson for your fight? I don't know. I don't know. It's, I don't know. But uh, for 100%, uh, uh, Chaparelli helps him. You know? Helps him uh, 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 some way, of course. You know, Show him some. Because he was so big. You know? He was a giant man. Right, so it's a giant, much bigger. So it's so strong, you know. And if you if you if you teach at least something for somebody, you know, an athletic guy that is a fighter, uh, you know, a smart fighter like uh, Olympic level, so he learn, he learns. So it helps him. It helps him. So were you aware? Yeah, almost, that almost caught him. Almost caught him the armbar. And he almost come twice, yeah, and then triangle um, too. And then a uh, 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 heel hook, heel hook. He was falling, and then he hold the fence and recover his balance. So if he fell, I got a good chance to 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 to, to you know to apply a heel hook. But he was standing and good balancing, and he got closer to me. And then I have to release the the, the, the position and, 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 and play a different way. It's it's incredible. The chess match going on between you two. And like uh, Tom Erickson in Pride, many people said, there's no way I'm fighting him. He's just too big. And you, yeah. went, for, you went 40 minutes with him and you were 185 pounds. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> That's fucking crazy. And yeah. did you know that at the get... time? At the time, I want to test myself. You know, uh, <laughs> they my my manager didn't want to put me in the show. They offered to put my students Carlos Barreto in the show and put me to the super fight, but I didn't accept that. I think I couldn't let my student fight somebody tougher than my opponent. And I I I really want to test myself. You know, I really want to go to the harder hardest fight possible to, to, to test my jiu-jitsu was something that I like to do. So it's, it, made, made, it made me stronger after that, 100%. Did you know that Rico Chipirelli got thrown out of Henzo's gym afterward? Yeah, after the fight, right? 
Yeah. 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 Aaron Hansel told me that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is, it man. Was, yeah. It was a war at the time. You know, we, we were fighting to prove Jiu Jitsu, and you know, it was an old style mentality, old school mentality. And that's it. But it was a good test, you know. And, 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 but I believe when Anton Erickson fought in Pride, he, he didn't have the same physical shape he was in, in 96. I think he was past his prime. He was nowhere yeah. near. He was in better yeah. shape in 96. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. I think so. Yeah. I think his shape in 96 was, you know, because I saw some fights, he was getting tired, you know, so it's, yeah, we fought for 40 minutes. So I didn't get any, you know, he got tired, but he was, he was in shape, in better shape, yeah. I think so. Big time. Yeah. I got a lot of respect for Tom. The Pentagon combat riot that you were on, what were you thinking when it was all going down or where were you at in the building? I was close to the ring, you know, to the, to the, to the cage, but I, I wouldn't get inside the fight. I mean, I was just fought. I just fought, stepped back to the ring one minute before and I said, man, I, I won't fight. Let them fight. I won't get involved. And I stepped back, you know, and watched the fight and it was, you know, it was sad because after that, the, the, the governor of the Rio de Janeiro and the mayor of the city, they both were in the, the gym, in the gym. You know, there was in the arena, inside the arena, watching the game alive. So it was bad for the sport. They, you know, they forbid the, 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 the Valley to the fights in Rio for a long time. They banished the fights. So... Too bad. Were you ever concerned in regards to your safety? No, I was not about safety, you know, was, but about to get involved in something so silly, you know, I'm gonna fight for what? What the reason? Because a, a, a rival between, you know, do not have any, any reason to fight. There's people that want to fight for nothing, you know? So let the fight, let the fight be solved inside the rings. You know, so as I was fighting in the inside the ring with the air general, and if there is some problem with the lights, that's where the light goes, you know, goes on again. It turn yeah. out and turn on the lights or whatever. I don't know. I don't know who started the fight, but you know, I, I wouldn't fight for I just, man, I want that to work. I, you know, I have a different mentality. At the time, I was amateur, but I had a professional mentality, you know. I get involved in the street fight because of nothing, you know? So I didn't know. I didn't know at the time. I didn't know at the time who was fighting. It was a, it was a big mess, so. Chairs. Yeah, there's three people yeah, throwing chairs. chairs. You know? So I didn't have reason to fight the guys from Ruta Libre. Why are you going to fight them? They didn't do anything for me, against me. You know? So. It was sad for the sport. I don't like that. You know, if you if you're a good fighter, go to the ring, go fight. You know, go fight a professional. Don't make a mess I, when people are working. That's my point of view. You know. Yeah. So I work and make my money, and you know, and bother my, my my job. So it bothers my job because uh, Pentagon belonged to Shake, uh, the owner of the AGCC. Tarnon. Tarnon, Tarnon. So you're going to make the Pentagon one after one. And the second one, I could choose my opponent again. So they, they, they gave me the right to choose my opponent. I said, man, I want to fight the best in my division. I want to fight the best in my division. So bring somebody good. And they tried to bring Frank Rock or, you know, Jerry Bolander. So they brought Jerry Bolander. So the next one, I'm going to ask somebody good as well. So we go to the best stage to show our skills, you know. So they fuck it up the thing. I'm sorry the, the, the language, but they, you know no, they screw okay. they screw the the, 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 the the business, you know, they screw the the, the, the the our jobs. So that's it. Did, did you get along with Sergio Battarelli, old school promoter and referee? Yeah, I met him a couple of times, but only in okay. some shows, I have no friendship relationship. Frederico Lapenda. 
Yeah, Federico, I met him many times. He's a, this is someone that I have a very good relationship. Yeah, heavily involved with the uh, Brazilian top team back in the day. No, no. Federico no? is a nice guy. He's a promoting fight, you know. Uh, he, he had academy with my old master, Carson Race, in, in, in Los Angeles, the Open Academy. So I don't know why it didn't work well. The business didn't work well for some reason. But Federico is somebody that I have a lot of respect and I like him very much. And he's working for the uh, tourism board for Brazil now. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I got a lot of respect for him as well. He's done very well for yeah, himself. Yeah, yeah, one of the one of the you know the the, the, the beginners to, to start to, to and promote. He promotes some shows in Brazil. He promoted a show in São Paulo. I think it was uh, is, end of '96 mm-hmm. when Fabio Gugel fought Mark uh, Mark Coleman. No, no, fought uh, Ken Shamrock. Ken Shamrock. No, no, no. Oh my God! Not Marco, I'm not Ken Shamrock. Uh, Joey Fabio Gurgel. Fabio Gurgel, he fought. Uh, actually, that was Bolander. Didn't he be? No, no, Bolander. Now was uh, Marquia. 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 Mark Kerr. He fought okay. Marquia. Yeah, in this show, it was uh, two or three fights at night. I don't know if it was eight men or, but he fought Marquia. It was, it was a super hard fight, but the second or third fight at the night. It was a super hard fight with no time limit as well. But Fabio got hurt in his eye. He got to 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 to, to finish. Yeah. To, 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 yeah. But medical stoppage. But he did pretty well. But Batarelli made uh, some shows in Brazil, some shows outside Brazil. Israel. He promoted in Israel. He promoted. Oh yeah, everywhere. no, he's real. He's real. He's yeah. legit. Legit, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was doing bigger things than some of the earlier prides. He was using that same recipe. It's just two, maybe seven or eight years too early. Yeah, he got involved in the promotions a yeah. uh, long time ago. Yeah. You you were also at the second ADCC, um, February twenty fourth, nineteen ninety nine. How do you get the invite? Uh, I got in the invitation because I was, I had a, 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 a good fight in history and I was fighting already, uh, Vale Tudo. So my name was already known. So I think that's the reason. Who was your roommate? My roommate, my roommate, good question. My roommate, well, I think it was Ricardo Liborio. Was it Liborio, huh? I think so. I think it was Ricardo Liborio, yeah. So your first opponent was Dexter Casey. You win by submission. Mm -hmm. Ricardo Almeida, you win by points. Yeah, and you, your third opponent was supposed to be Salo Riberio, but the match yeah. did not take place. No, no, it was Salo. I fought the semifinal against Salo. Okay, so you actually fought Salo on the ADCC yeah. website. It's an unknown result. No, 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 no. I fought Salo. I lost by points, advantage, whatever. But I, I, I fought Salo, one hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. I supposed it's... to fight for the third place, uh, but I I wasn't feeling well. I kind of didn't sleep for the last you know nights before, so actually I didn't fight. I didn't sleep any 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 night before the fights because I arrived uh, like three days before the the show, and the, the different time, different zone of time, you know, make me. I, you know, it bothered my, 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 my sleep. So okay. and then after the fight, I was a little bit low because of my performance. I know I could do much better. And I didn't want to fight for third place because I didn't have the, in Jiu Jitsu, didn't have this, 
the future, the, 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 to fight for the third place, you know? So my concern about third place at the time was nothing. So I got yes. third place, come on, I want to fight for the first place. So, and then I, I decided didn't, I didn't, I wouldn't fight. So, but I didn't know there was money involved after that I got, I got a, I got, I should concern about the prize money. You anyway. should have went for third place. Yeah, you should have went for third yeah. place. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and uh, Ricardo Almeida that I won, fought and won the third place. So, oh. <laughs> he got a prize. But well, I fought the absolute class after that. You know, the next day is the absolute class. Yeah. I was, uh, yeah, the next day. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was the next day or same day. I don't remember, but I fought. I got so pissed that I, you know, I'd lose money. When I knew I'd lose money, I said, no, I need to make some money. So and you beat I, I, I Ivan Salivary, and then your second yeah. round is Rico Rodriguez. Yeah, Rico Rodriguez was big. So I, I I felt my endurance, my 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 stamina, and I got tired during the fight. So I lost. Right. Do you remember Paquetao, the video recorder? Of course, yes. Super. So, how does Paquetao have a very good relationship with the Gracie family? Of course, because he's Carlson black belt, but also no issues with the loot delivery people. How is he able to keep a good balance? Oh, Pakatani was a super nice guy. You know, was somebody that, you know, was, it's really hard to don't like him. So, because he's so, so nice. He's a very nice person. Man. You know, he kind of have a good relationship with everybody. So it's, it will be hard people don't like him. And he was the first guy to film the the, the fights, the tournaments, and everything. So the, his his uh, videos. I don't know how to call it in English. The, 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 his videos are still being watched today. All of the yes, old school the, videos the, on yeah, YouTube, the, the documents him. like became the documents, and also a lot of important fights that only. He was the only person that had. So he started my first my, my first final. I think he was there, you know, filming the the the, the, the tournament, the competition. He was filming the competition when I was 16, 17 years old, something like that. <clears throat> so he would even film like the beginner belts. Yeah, he filmed everybody, everyone, everyone. The blue belts, the purple belts. He spent oh the day God. filming the whole tournament. And in the end, he has a camera for each mat. So we used to have two mats only during the competition. It was only two matches. And he, he had a, a camera for each one. So he document all, everything. That's incredible. He filmed it. He filmed it everything, just for fun because you know. There's no money. Yeah, you lose money. Yeah, no money. Some people they they they, they ask him to, to to you know this. He sold some uh, uh, videos, but most of the time was for fun. He do it because he liked it. He was in love for 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 for, for jiu jitsu and for fights. Did Pride ever offer you Sakuraba? No, never, never. It was something I, I think it could do a, 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 a very good match. You know, Sakuraba is an amazing fighter and good skills, standing skills, good grappler skills. So it would be an interesting fighting. Why do you think they never offered you him? I don't know. I have no reason. I mean, I don't know. I don't know the reason. It would be an interesting fight. I would yeah. like to fight him. A similar weight class, too. I mean, at yes. one point. Yes, yes, yes. Similar weight class. Yeah, he was fighting all the the graces at the time. I, I, I you know, asked my, 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 my manager to try to get who could a fight against him. That never happened. 
How would you describe your move from Carlson Gracie to the Brazilian top team? Yeah, it was, as people know already, it was because of uh, a contract that Castle made. Castle was leaving U.S. and uh, for some reason he thought the students would leave him. It wasn't real. So people didn't, didn't want to believe him at all. And instead, you were organizing the team. And he made he, he make the summary of the situation. He made a contract saying that the students, the fighters, must pay everything about everything. Sponsorship, 20% about purses, you know, five purses. Everything, any, any money you know, you make, you have to pay him 20%. But in the country, didn't say how many days he should train us. So they only said that he, we could use his gym to train. So we were in Brazil training by myself. Uh, my, my, my last two fights, I had to go to US to train with him on my own expenses. So I pay to go there to train for one month when I fought Tom Erickson. And then when I fought Bolander, I went there and training for two weeks on my own expenses. So um, we thought it would have, you know, I, I used to pay 20% to him, always never complain, but we thought it wasn't right. It didn't show that, uh, you know, Carson had to train us. So he got to receive money with no work as a coach, just appearing the day of the fight. That's the only obligation. And everybody thought it wasn't right. I told him that, you know, and I have a conversation. I was the old, I think it was the, the oldest one fighting. And I, I have a good relationship with him, explaining him that. I said, people disagree with that. If you want to make a contract, let's go to attorney and make a contract fair for both parts. He disagreed with that. He said, must be this contract, in, you know, and, and, and we disagreed with that. It should, we thought it was unfair. It was unfair. Uh, and then this, this time, the discussion, they were talking about this. A peer fight, they, 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 they invite me to fight in UFC in Japan. And then look for him. And I told him, Gasson, look, uh, let's go to Japan with me. You know, uh, no worries about training and everything. Just go to Japan. I pay 20% and then we'll return. We, we, we find this, you know, we, we solve this problem with the contract got together for so long, it cannot, it cannot be an issue between our relationship. I said, no, I won't go. And I said, man, I have to go. I would like you to go with me. I said, I don't want to go. And then I went, uh, you know, by myself with my, 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 my friends. And I won. And after the fight, the Japanese told me that uh, Carson released a note that I was excluded from the team. And when I returned to Brazil, I looked for him, went to his academy, I had a, an hour, one hour private conversation, I explained to him the mistake he was doing. You know, I was doing my best for him for the last, you know, all of the time I was there, I was together with him for the last 25 years. And, you know, I was elected for the Soscarson Race Association by Unanimous for, for the whole uh, students crew of Carson, you know, they vote for me to be a president of the Carson Grace Club in 19, 19, 1998. We found a Carson Grace Club to organize the team, you know, organize the, 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 the academies. So it was uh, the first association. I think it was the first one association among all others. And I thought at the beginning that was, a, a, you know, a, 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 a misunderstanding that, you know, would pass and Carson would 
step back, you know, and, and, and realize that it was being so hard with the contract issue. And you could do something uh, like you want something professional, you want to do business, so you have to negotiate, right? So, but uh, I call him sometimes after that. He said he keep this. He was keeping his his, his decision, and I really thought at the time it was past. You know, I got him back, return to the reality, and understand the mistake he was doing. And then one day I met him in the social meeting, like. Uh, and I would shake his hand. He refused to shake my hand. And then from this day I had a kind of stop asking him anything. I stopped calling him, you know, and then I I follow my way. And some and then after that he put off the team, some of my friends. And then we went to train in my academy and keep training people, more people coming, you know, Minotauro coming, Minotoro coming, and you know, guys coming to train with me and my partners. I would, I, I wouldn't refuse. You know, I would say no. You know, so if Castle want to look at me and you know, still have a door open, it wasn't the end. But Castle was talking a lot of bad things about me and my friends, and and keep you know, bombing us like you know, so talking a lot of things that coming from an old friend for somebody that had a relationship it hurts but even that was the 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 you know the the i mean was the finish the finish went it was when uh when i was about to fight uh chuck legal and then i knew that castle went there to offer him to train against me and then this was the you know the 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 deadline was the end for me, but after that, did not have any condition to have a, you know, a, a, a deal? So it's after that, I kind of it is what it is. Forgot, yeah. yeah, it is what it is. I forgot completely and moved myself. And, you know, so, let, let me ask you a couple of questions. Carlson was a very hard guy, very set in his ways, and sometimes he would say he would say things to provoke somebody and one of those things was he would publicly talk about Hickson in Liborio he would say Liborio is the guy to beat Hickson Liborio is the guy to beat Hickson you know that, that those fights never took place as well as like Alan Goez Alan Goez is a seven-time national champion he loses one time in seven years in the absolute by an advantage in overtime. Why did Alan and Liborio never get to have a match against Hickson? Yeah, Liborio, uh, Alan, I think he, Alan never fought in the black belt in the nationals. I think he, when he left Brazil, he was still a brown belt. He was a black belt at the age of 18. That's what my research tells me. When? At the age of 18, he reached black belt. 18. 18 uh, years old. 18 years old, I don't think so. I don't know. Okay. Because uh, as I remember, I think Alan, when he left Brazil to you, and he went to live in the U.S., I'm not sure. He was a brown belt, but not sure. But anyway, Alan was a great fighter, one of the best ever. I have trained with him for a long time. He part of Brazilian top team. I have the pleasure to help him in his when he was fighting, when he was training to fight uh, Sakuraba. Uh, I helped his help him bring his camp. And Karl Malenko as well. He tried. That's the reason I went to Pride in '98 to watch his fight against uh, Sakuraba and help him in the corner. Uh, but different time, you know, when uh, Liborio arrived, uh, the the black belt, I think the Hicks already left Brazil to live in the U.S. It's different timing, you know. But Liborio is an amazing fighter, you know, one of the toughest guys I ever trained with. Always pushed me 
push my limits and all along is the same. So the, the both are, are great, great fighters. But I don't know, it's probably Hickson wasn't competing in, in Brazil anymore. You know, he left, Hickson left Brazil in what, 89 or 90s? Yeah, 89. Like that. Yeah. 89, right? Yeah, 89. So I got my black belt in 88. So Liborio got his black belt after me. So they we Alan as well. So when Hickson was already in, 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 in none of them were 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 black belts. Hundred okay. percent. So Vitor Belfort and Todd Medina are not listed as Carlson Gracie black belts. Do you think there's a reason that they were left off of that list? I don't know. I think the castle made the list before they got a black belt. I mean, the list was released before the probably there was more black belts in the US. You know, I don't know. I have no reason. I don't know. I, don't know. I think he released maybe he released the list before he moved to to, to US. Okay, so it was enough. Vitor is yeah, Vitor is a black belt. As I know, he, Black belt from Castle. It, so, it's not listed. It's not listed on the database. Oh yeah, should be. Yeah. I think should be. Yeah. It, 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 Todd Medina is supposedly the first Carlson American black belt. He was working out with the team, and when the split happened, I know he stayed, you know, with Carlson, but he's also left off of that list. It's very interesting. Yeah, I, I remember Todd, but I don't, I don't, I really don't know his his degrees, his graduation in jiu-jitsu because he used to train with, you know, with no geese and he was in the MMA training spa, Vale Tudo's trainings every day, and, I don't know, not, maybe not every day, but most of the times he were there. Uh, he helped me a lot to train sometimes with me, tough guy. But I really don't know. I, I can't tell about Toddy because I don't remember his graduation. I met him. I think I met him when, in '96 when I was I was making my camp. I made my camp in, in Carson's Academy in Los Angeles, and after that I returned in '97 to fight. I made my camp to fight Jerry Bolander. So that were two times that I met Todd. Probably two times. But I don't remember the, the about the fights and the, everything else. Okay. But Vitor, Vitor, I'm, 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 I know better. You started Rio Jiu Jitsu Club with Sergio Bolea. Balao. Balao. Yes. Yeah. Balao. Yeah. How would you describe Big your relationship? Ball. Yeah. Yeah, it was we 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 grow up training together. Uh, I were more graduate than Sergio. Uh, and I, I got a, we were, you know, I was training together. I went to train with his students and with him at the time, you know, I, I got, we hang out together. We were friends. And I got a, a good location uh, in the very nice neighborhood in, in, in Rio. So then it was a little bit expensive just for, for me. And because of my good relationship with him, uh, I invite me to invite him to 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 do my part, to be my partner in this you know, business, and work it well. We, we we build a very good team, you know, for, for so long. Like we worked together for from 90, 95, 1995 to nineteen ninety nine, and then each one uh, uh, opt you know, to, to follow his own way, kind yeah. of. We broke up, you know, but uh, I think we did a lot together, but it was a time that people followed their own way, you know. So I followed my way, and, uh, and Bolo has our own ideas, different ideas, you know, got a, some different ideas that had to make us to, to, to choose different paths, different ways. Yeah, nothing wrong. Yeah, nothing wrong with no, that. Nothing wrong. Natural, you know. We 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 build a, a very good competition team at the time. Yeah. 
April 14, 2000, UFC Japan. It's your debut. You fight Yuji Anjo. He's a very popular wrestler. They say some Yakuza connections. Was there any pressure from the Yakuza in regards to this match with that of yourself? No, not at all. No pressure at all. It was, the treatment was like, uh, you know, it was, it was the first time I went to Japan to fight. The treatment was a kind of very good, you can tell, very good treatment. So cannot complain anything. No pressure at all. October 31st, 2000, Pancras, Sane Kakuda. He beat Salo Riberio in, uh, in ADCC the following year. I think that's one of those fights that people need to pay attention to because that is not an easy opponent. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, something happens. When I was leaving Brazil and arrived in Japan, I got infection in my, in my, my cough. And when I arrived in Japan, I went to, straight to the hospital to open, you know, like to have to cut and put the pus, you know, the infection out. Like, you know, it was very painful. And I took a lot of antibiotics the whole week. I arrived on Saturday and I fought on Thursday or Friday. I don't remember now. But I think it was the weekdays, not uh, Saturday. I think it was Thursday or Friday. Anyway, I was, I, you know, I, I felt my, 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 my condition. It affected my condition, you know. And I, I made a, a kind of smart fight, not pushing that much. I kind of, I did the, the, the enough to, to win the fight. You know, I knew my condition was, it was, it was a long round, 50 minutes, no breaks. And I, I knew my condition wasn't perfect. So I didn't push that much. You know, I kind of did the, 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 the last possible to, to win the, the fight without, would in risk my condition. He was from Team Grabaka, which is a famous, a world famous gym out of Japan. Yeah, he was the one to accept to fight me. Of his team, the one, the only one that accept to fight me was Sanai Kikuta, a tough guy. Very tough, sixteen tough and three, yeah. super tough guy. Yeah. So you had talked about it earlier, September twentieth, two thousand one, Chuck Liddell, UFC thirty three. He's eight and one. He gets approached by your former coach, Carlson Gracie, about training. You lose a very controversial split decision. And I was told that Dana White talked with you backstage personally. Was what was that conversation about? Yeah. Uh, they loved, they went to the rocker room, Joe Silva and, 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 and Dana White. They said sorry about the, the gym match. They couldn't do anything because about uh, it was about uh, the how the commission. Call it? The, the commission, the athletic commission from Nevada, uh, and it was about them, you know. So that's it. It is what it is. So they give the results, but they, you know, he was sorry about that, but that's it. I think I won the fight. I think I did, you know, a, a very good performance. It was a very tough fight. Jack Liddell was, he come from two knockouts. Uh, Guy Mazer and, and Kevin Handelman, one UFC, one in Pride. And I was, I was one year without fight. My last MMA fight was uh, against Kikuta in September, October. It was, almost a year. So, and then I, they invite me to fight, I got it. You know, I, I signed it. And, uh, but I knew it, was, it should be a very tough fight. It was. Chuck, yeah, Chuck had cardio issues after round one. I, I thought it was, yes. I, thought you, I thought you won. Yeah, and, but the motherfucker, I mean, he, 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 he hit so hard, man. <laughs> He hit me in the first round. Wow. He has a heavy hands, I can tell. And his timing. His timing is what throws everybody off because he doesn't throw normal type punches. Yeah, but at the time, I didn't, I mean, uh, I didn't use the protection, you know. I didn't wrap my hands. 
So I didn't, I didn't, I don't like, I didn't like to fight with gloves because bother my, my, my grappling grips. And I didn't used to do that. So it bothers, uh, then later I realized that with, uh, you know, if I went rapid, my hand, the punch of good foot would be much stronger. So that, that how they fight at the time, you know, so I, it was, it was hard. The first round, he hit me super hard, but I survived it. Then I returned the second one very angry, very angry, very hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I think I think I did a good job, you know. I I, I think I was surprised with my skills on the feet, like my standing skills. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Well, in regards to what Dana White and Joe Silva thought of that match and what took place, your very next fight was at UFC for the UFC was at UFC 35, January 11, 2002 for the world title against Dave Manet. Dave yeah. Manet. So, in... <sighs> yeah. So after Chuck Liddell fight, they gave me two options. Or I would fight Chuck again. I could fight Chuck if I rematch Chuck. Or they're going to give me the title match against the champion Dave Manet. So, okay. I would get, a, if I choose Chuck, I got a super of fight if I win you know then I have to fight for the belt against Tito so two fights to get a belt I mean you know or I go straight to the fight to the to the to the I mean to the belt fighting Dave Mene so I the belt below the, the belt yeah, below I, right? yeah so I I, I I want a belt so I, I sure I knew I, I, I deserve a belt any belt so I I, sh I, I choose the shortcut and I, I went straight to the belt, and I won. But my plan was make some fights in the middleweight and return to the light heavyweight to fight as well. I knew I had condition to fight in the light heavyweight, even being lighter, you know, because I had been fighting tough guys my whole life, so like big, bigger guys than me in jiu-jitsu and valetudo. So after the, the, the Tom Erickson fight, it gave me a lot of confidence that I could beat people bigger than me, you know. So that was my plan, but never happened. So I had uh, two more fights and I left. Unceremoniously. Yeah, yeah, you left. Um, well, Dave Manet, in my opinion at this time, may have been probably the most well-rounded American fighter. I think he's underappreciated and like yourself, somebody that's deserving to be in the UFC Hall of Fame. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah he was, Dave Manier was very legit. Well -rounded. Yeah, yeah, he was well rounded. Yeah. Yeah, he had like 40 some odd fights. He was by tough, time. good skills, yeah. standing, you know, good hands, Muay Thai game, and good grappler game as well. With the Matt Lindland fight, May 10th, 2002, UFC 37. Now that's the infamous fake tap. You've watched that fight. Do you think it was a fake tap, or do you think it was just hand movements? Man, I think it was a fake tap. I think he tapped. Uh, I don't know if he pretended to be fake, but he tapped. But I didn't stop the fight because he tapped. I stopped the fight because the referee told me to stop. So Big John, he, he touched my chest and, you know, he sent me to release. I release. And he got in doubt because when I release, Matt Lina said he didn't tap. And then Big John tried to put his arm back. <laughs> and he tried to put his arm back and then Matt Lina just stand up and you know, he got conf completely lost. I think, you know, it was the biggest mistake that uh, uh, Big John made. And he sent me to my corner and I got completely peace and crazy. So, okay. But what you could have done is say, no, 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 I'm not fighting. You made the decision. That's what we're going to abide by. If it's a mistake, it's on you, not me. But you did not do that. 
you fought him a second time that night. Yeah, I did. <laughs> and I got lucky, man, because I could do it again. So if if I lose that, if, you know, if I if I lost the fight, it will be the, the most uh, 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 unfair result ever. There would have been but, two. There would have been two or two unfair results out of three fights. Yes. Yeah, but I did yeah. again. So it uh, <laughs> it was. But I know what it was. I had three big ta- mental tests in my career. The first one was against Tom Erickson. The second one was against Matt Lindland when the situation, you know. And the third one was against Rampage that I had to fight. Uh, I fought with no training, you know, at all. So, uh, but Matt Linda was super hard, you know, to, to keep my focus. It was, it was difficult. So after they, they restarted the fight, I got completely, I, I lost my focus, you know, so I could fight to the end of the round. In the break, my corner was concerning to, you know, bring me back, to make myself, to keep me calm, be did able you to keep fighting. Did you have an adrenaline dump after Big John separated you? Not adrenaline dump, but a kind of mental... Uh, Drain, okay. Yeah, mental... Uh, like it's finished. It got low, yeah. like, you know, it's kind of... You lose your focus, so I got so peace, so peace, you know, <laughs> that I, 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 if I opened the door of the octagon, I could leave. I was completely peace, and, you know, mad. And, um, and I, you know, I keep fighting for some reason, and uh, my, my corner helped me to, to, you know, calm me down, trying to calm me down. And I keep fighting the second round, I, you know, I return. I think I did a good second round as well, as well. And I don't know if it was the second or the third round. I broke his nose with a jab. That started to make the difference. Two, two situations made the difference. One over the kick from the bottom, you know, that I, I, I reached his solar plex. He said that after the fight that borders, and after I broke his nose, or at least I make it bleed, he, he couldn't breathe well. He said the both borders him after the fight. You had, a, I, you had an infection in your right finger heading into yeah, that this fight finger, as well. Yeah. This yeah. finger here, yeah. you see. So I got an infection here in my, you know, and I couldn't train proper because I, when I hit, it hurt so bad. And I did to grappler, you know, it hurts. So I spent part of the camp tra- tra- doing the only physical training. And then, uh, but it's, it, it works, you know, for some reason, I didn't feel any pain during the fight. So, so it, it's, it works, but it bothers me because I lose at least, I lost at least 10 days of my training camp of technical training, you know. So I only return to training, to, to my camp, to, to make technical trainings, uh, probably 10 days before, before I, I, I travel. So, From the, I got 10 days before this 10 days that I couldn't train proper. So I was a little bit insecure okay. for this fight. Because I knew it would be a tough fight, you know. Uh, Matt Linda was an undefeated guy, he was a very good wrestler. And, you know, I, I, I couldn't train proper. So, but in the end, it works very well for my side. Matt Lindland's wrestling career was much more controversial than his MMA career. And there's a lot of controversy there. What he did in wrestling, it's not even comparable. It's much crazier. 
is okay. wrestling. I, I didn't know yeah. that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Rusima Proharis, <laughs> your old student, would always hold on to a submission too long. Was this partly, in fact, because you being his teacher, did this Matt Lindland match affect you to where you would kind of reiterate, keep holding on, keep holding on, or was... Yeah, I always said to my students in general to keep holding to be completely clear that uh, the referee saw the position, you know? If people tap clearly, you release. But, you know, uh, but don't be, you know, the goal is not hurt people, you know, I mean, you hold to win. I mean, you know, the goal is win the fights. My goal never went to, 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 to hurt people, you know, so uh, the only, the only reason I give the, this, uh, instruction where uh, it was to people make sure they won the fight you know so that's it what about how would you describe Paul Harris's style of training and holding on to the submissions I man it's hard to tell you know it's it's he isn't too smart, you know. I, I, I tried to help him the way I could, you know. I always, I always gave him to good advice. In the beginning, he followed my, my words, he followed my instructions. But in the end, after he got a UFC, you know, so he stopped listening to me. So then he got a, a lot of disagreements. And then finally, the, the relationship were completely was completely bitter. And then he left, you know, but we're, we, we disagree a lot, you know, so I can tell that in the end, the relationship wasn't good. So the best that he did was to leave and, you know, follow his own path and, you know, try to make his career good in different place because uh, our relationship wasn't good in the end, you know. Okay. So, but, well, it's better for both of you then. It's better yes, for both. Yes, better for both. So... But he, I can tell that he, he had, I don't know, my, I didn't follow him that much after he left, but uh, his skill was amazing. He, you know, I, if, he's, he's, he, if he listened to me, it was a kind of guy that were, were I gonna took him to be a world champion pretty easy. You know, just had to listen to me because to train him, for me to train a, 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 a good grappler, so with good, hand skills is easy because I just, you know, teach him to do the same thing that I did that worked for me very well. So I could fight all kinds of fighters, you know, striker, grapplers in the good way, in the good, very good level, you know. So could the wrestler with the wrestlers, I could strike with the strikers, you know, so I feel very confident to do everything. And my fight against Chuck Liddell was the first fight that I had to strike her against a striker because it was super hard to take him down. First round, I take him down a couple of times. I couldn't hold him there. But after second and third, I kind of decided to, you know, exchange punches. And I, I think I did very well. So it gave me a lot of confidence, you know. For, so it's when I fought Dave, Dave Mann and, and Matt Linden on my I was super confident on my hands. At the end of this fight, you were offered a new contract, but there was a contingency that you got to shop around and take other offers. How would you describe the negotiation process with the UFC when you were their champion? Disaster. So uh, it was a disaster. Uh, UFC made, a, made a, 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 the biggest mistake ever. Before my fight, because of my finger issue, I asked my manager to renew my contract. They said no. They didn't want to renew my contract before the fight against Matt Lindley. They didn't accept that. And then I won the fight to this controversial situation. And they offered me money. It was a good money. So, but 
I knew the prices in Japan was better. And I, I had a, a right in my contract to look around, you know. So I, 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 I asked them a time, time out to take a look in the market, you know. So, but for some reason, it didn't happen. Nothing happens. And then I returned to sign the contract. And what they did, they dropped the offer for the same amount of money I received my fight against Matt Lindland. And then I said, no, not at all. I accept the offer you made, but not the, for the same amount of money I received against Matt Lindland, especially because I had an issue with the judgment of the referee. And then we, we disagree with, you know, that's it. And then I left. That's the only reason I left, you know. So it's a, uh, was a, I think it was more a mistake from their, their side than mine, you know. So, how would you describe your relationship with Joe Silva? Professional. I have no, nothing to say, nothing bad to say against Joe Silva, Matt, or Dana White. They're professionals, you know. They always treat me very well when I was in the UFC. So it was a, it was a business decision. So no bad feelings. What about Dana White? No bad feelings at all. No, always, it was always where he were, he were, he was always respectful to me when I met him after that, you know. So I don't think he, he, he carried any bad feelings about me. Does not have any reason? So Ricardo Arona breaks his hand, and you had mentioned fighting Quentin Jackson. That was August tenth, two thousand three, in Pride. You had no, you were not in the gym on a consistent basis for that fight. Yeah, I was. I was expecting to be called to fight the, the Grand Prix. It was June, two thousand three. So I was training to fight. Expect to be called. But they didn't call, they call Arona, they invite Arona. So then I stopped training and started to work as a coach only. I was training to help, you know, but most of the time I was coaching the team. You know, I thought we would fight as well. And, and Arona hurt himself, but, you know, Arona used to fight hurt anytime so <laughs> I heard a little hurt for a guy like him wasn't that much and then uh, they went they, 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 they traveled to Japan on Saturday I supposed to go on Monday because I was coaching and then uh, they sent a message they called me Monday morning I was about to leave on Monday evening they called and said hey man I don't know hurt, got hurt. And tried to wonder somebody from 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 Brazilian top team fight to replace him. And I said, okay. And my respect called me, said, yeah, man, I had my, my hand was broken. So you're the guy. He said, man, no way, I didn't train for that. I have no condition to fight. So and then I travel. On Monday, I arrive on Wednesday, and then the Japanese, they were very upset with the situation, you know, with the, just a couple of days for the, for the Grand Prix, and they want somebody to replace. And then, you know, uh, I got a little bit worried about the future of our team in Japan. And I made a, you know, accept the offer. I, I mean, I, I negotiated a good, a good, good deal for me. But and then I fought. You know, that's it. But if there is another way, I wouldn't fight. It is the only way I had to 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 keep the relationship. And you know, that's it. I didn't want to fight at all. Yeah, because I I, I knew I didn't have stamina and endurance enough to fight you know so i didn't I, I didn't know if i could finish the fight you know 
because I wasn't prepared enough. It was anyway, split decision. It was split decision, very controversial. Split decision, yeah. I think I think I did very well. I think I won the fight. Yeah. You know, I got a motion so. with him. They, they stopped the fight for five minutes to 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 tie his his short. And anyway, I think I did. I, I'm proud about what I did. It was a very, it was a big mental challenge. Every time during the the, the break, I sit down in my corner. And I thought, man, I can I can do it anymore. I can, I'm super tired. You know, after ten minutes round, and one voice inside my head said, one more round, one more round. <laughs> okay, one more round, boom. <laughs> and it was a three rounds, one ten to five. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And the so the second to third said, man, I'm, I'm devastated. I can't do it anymore. I said, one more round, one more round. The voice in my head, and then I do it again. But the the, the third round, I got. You know, uh, uh, something happens because I don't have stamina to move. I, you know, my footwork was completely compromised because I was so tired. So I didn't start to hit my legs and I couldn't escape. And then it hurts me. But it's the only, the only time during the fight that, you know, it got me because I, I, I played very well with on the feet, you know, playing with my hands. I have myself, so it's completely undersized. You were undersized as well. Yeah, he was much bigger. Yeah, he was much bigger as well. Yeah, I'm talking about the size, he was in shape, completely in shape. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was so, out of. If you see my picture, I was completely out of shape. I was even with the belly, small belly, like drinking beers and all, hang out. <laughs> the weekend before, I was drinking beers with my party with my friends. After the show, there was a show in Rio. I think it was in the, uh, in the on the hills Mecca show, and on, on uh, some of my own fighters they fought. Bitech. yeah, Batech. No, no, Batech, no Mecca, Mecca. That was in Curitiba. Mecca, Mecca okay. was from from Rudimar Rodrigo guys from Shoot Your Box show. They made a, a show in Teresópolis in the, on the okay. hills of. Was it Brigadero? No, it wasn't. Br no, it wasn't Brigadero either. Okay. No, no, no. It was uh, so. It was a show. It was an event. Anyway, we hang out after the show, drinking beers, and you know. So, anyway, I think I did a good performance, and but it is what it is, you know. I think I won in my mind. Like you know, I I, I think it could they could give me the the victory, but. Anyway, just the challenge to be able to to do something for me was very hard to do, you know, almost impossible to 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 finish the fight. Made me it made me happy. So let me throw. We're going to wind up right now. So I'm going to throw a couple different matches at you, where you weren't in it, but you were in the corner, and I want to know your thoughts of what took place. Uh, UFC 154, November 17th, 2012. Patrick Cote versus Alessio Sakara. You're in Patrick Cote's corner, and then Conan Silvera is in Alessio Sakara. I always liked when I would see the old school Brazilian guys in different students' corner and the chess match that would take place. Do you recall that fight? Yeah, I, 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 I remember the fight. Uh, this fight was, uh, Patrick Cote was a student of my student, Fabio Landa from Canada. And I was there to help him to, you know, the way I could. The, isn't, isn't, I mean, uh, I was there to fight, to, to, to help Fabio to corner him. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I, didn't, I, I wasn't in his camp, in Patrick Cote camp. But I know that Fabio had been had done a very good uh, 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 training camp for Cote, so Cote was in shape. But Sakara was a great fight fighters as well. So you know, uh, so yeah, it was like a DQ punches to the back of the head. Yeah, um, yeah, it was a, so it was a it's a stop it because he used uh, I don't remember that much. I think he, just, yeah, the, punch. the back of the head. Yeah, punch the yeah. back of the head. That's it. Yeah. Okay. September 18th, 2022, 
Gordon Ryan faced off against your black belt, Roosevelt Sousa. Who? Sousa. Roosevelt Sousa. Roosevelt. Roosevelt. He's a no, black belt on No, 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 no. Roosevelt is not my black belt. Okay. Okay. Roosevelt. No, no. Roosevelt. No, no. Roosevelt Sousa. Where? Okay. Okay. Let me tell you. Let me. Let me. Oh, that was ADCC. No, no, who's well, just on my black belt. Okay, let me throw some names at you then. Daryl Golar. Daryl Golar, yeah. American wrestler Daryl Golar went and trained yeah, with you Darryl, for a while. Yes, yeah, Daryl was my wrestler coach for for some years. I trained under him from two thousand one. To 2000, some breaks back and forth to 2008, I think so. Yeah, yeah, I, I learned a lot of you know, that it was a damn good wrestler coach. He, you know, he, he taught me a lot of wrestler, good quality, you know, it's his, his training was very tough, very good. I liked him as a coach very much. They said, they said he went down there for three weeks in order to instruct, work out, and he got addicted to the Brazilian lifestyle and moved down there for a long time. <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> it's true. Uh, and he, 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 he loved Rio, you know, he, he became Carioca. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> What about uh, David Bilkeden, the first non-Brazilian black belt under yourself? Yeah, David Bilkeden uh, is a Swedish guy, uh, super tough. He's a black belt under one of my black belts. And he fought a UFC a couple of times. He got a short yes. notice that he didn't perform well. And two other fights, and they cut him. But he, I, I think he deserved a little bit more, another chance. He's a good fighter, very good fighter. He was another guy that got addicted to the Brazil lifestyle. Yes, yes. People that come to Rio and have a good reactions, you know, that that people help them to show them the, you know, the the, the good things of the city, you know, the food and the, the nice places. They got, a, they got crazy. You know, it's a beautiful city. Mario Sperry. Yeah, Mario Sperry was an old friend. He's, uh, he got a partnership in the Brazilian top team. We built it together. So we did a lot together. He was one of the toughest guys I ever, ever trained. You know, super tough guy, amazing fighter. So we built Brazilian top team together. We did a lot together. In your his instructional video, uh, where yeah. you were at, <laughs> I didn't had speak to, any English. It's so funny. <laughs> he had to ask he you speak multiple. Good, uh, yeah, he speaks very good English, but I didn't speak anything, so it was a funny thing. He had to ask you to slow down on more than one occasion because you were defending a little too well in that video. Oh yeah, I don't remember. <laughs> That's pretty funny. We spent yeah. we spent a couple of days together. At the end, we couldn't, you know, we were tired of each other. Oh my god, this funny, funny time. We'll close with this. Did Phil Baroni used to always call you out? Fight fan on the underground forum had posted this. Uh, he would always call you Booster. When you guys ran into each other backstage, was there ever any issues or confrontation between the two of you? No, no. Phil Baroni, he, he called me out because when I was in the the negotiation of UFC about to leave and I left and the guys told them to promote, to call me out, to return to UFC. He told me that in person. He asked excuse. He excused himself and said, you know, I'm sorry. I didn't want to offend you. It was a business. I said, no problem at all. You know, it's part of business and, you know, I understand him. But I was, and I met him in Japan during the Grand Prix in 2005. He was always respectful to me. No, no, no bad feeling. That's good. 
Marillo, man, I, I, as a child, you were one of my heroes, man. In all honesty, it's an Thank absolute you. honor, an honor to do this interview with you. And uh, Thank I you. really appreciate, appreciate your time, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. Appreciate Pleasure. it, brother. All right. Thank you, sir. And I'll be in touch, Marillo. Thank you, man. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Yep, yep. Ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up Marillo Bustamante. If you liked that interview, we've got an entire library with the same type of questions, same type of order. Our format does not change at all. Um, so you can't kind of catch the rhythm of it. If you guys can like, share, subscribe, let a friend know. We're like on the verge of being demonetized by YouTube right now because they keep kicking the people off that actually listen to our program. Um, so if you guys can please just spread the word, it's greatly appreciated. If you guys want to help out with us, get a hold of us through Instagram. Um, we've got three or four people that pitch in where they can. It's a passion project recording MMA history. So I hope you guys like this as much as, as much as I did as a fan. So this is our attempt at keeping the sport alive in its stories. So please like, share, and subscribe. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.